Yes, sir. Can we start the program? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ruchi, you can okay. start. Yeah, I think sir join so we can start. Yeah. A very good afternoon to all. I, Dr. Ruchi Tripathi, Assistant Advisor with NAC. I welcome all of you on behalf of National Assessment and Accreditation Council. NAC is organizing a series of state wise webinars for sensitizing all higher education institutions across the country about NEP 2020 and bringing HEIs forward for NAC assessment and accreditation process. In this regard, a webinar focusing on multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, academic bank of credit, skill development, appropriate integration of Indian languages, outcome-based education, distance education, online education is organized for all the university and affiliated college. We are from that, uh, Professor Amrikumarath, Dr. V. S. Ponmidiras, Dr. Nilees, and myself, Ruchi. So our today's program, we are going to organize a today, to, today program coordinator. In this regard, I request Professor Amir Kumar Ratsa, sir, please welcome and give the opening remark for the today program. So good afternoon to one and all present here. This program is basically on, I mean, uh, implementation of NEP in different uh, states. That's, that's very important because NEP document is ready there are a lot of awareness program has been conducted i mean uh, uh, sensitization sensitizing this uh, national education policy 2020 even the academic bank of credit also has been announced by uh, our prime prime minister uh, narendra modi ji uh, the idea is uh, focusing more on multidisciplinary and holistic education academic bank of credit multiple entry and exit system promotion of vocational education, uh, Indian languages, arts and culture, including Indian knowledge system, outcome-based learning, online and digital education, ensuring equitable use of technology. These are the thrust of this national education policy. We are trying to incorporate certain things in our uh, manual also. Subsequently, we'll do that. Uh, uh, but uh, but after, after the presentation by Professor Alok Chakrawal, who is a vice chancellor of uh, Central oh. University, Guru Ghasida Central University, Chhattisgarh. Then we will have interactions program. We will have some kind of panel discussions like uh, your observations you can share so that uh, other people also, everybody can share their experience, share their observations, how this can be implemented, what is the best part of this, and uh, to implement uh, NEP, uh, what are the policies needs to be developed, needs to be set up by the state government, all those points we can discuss after the presentation is over. We will give opportunity to each one of you to interact, to ask questions, to share your experience about NEP after the presentation. I mean, I request all of you to mute your audio, except the presenter, so that there will not be any disturbances during the presentation. After the presentation is over, then you can interact, give your suggestions, give your I mean, observations, and you can write in the chat box if you want to uh, say anything you can write in the chat box so that I can I will call each one of you uh, who, I mean sequentially in the chat box and all of you can give your observations over to over to Ruchi. Thank you so much sir for your opening remarks. Now we have today's speaker uh, Dr. Professor Alok Chakrawal sir. Let us introduce about the Chakrawal sir. Dr. Alok Kumar Chakrawal, Vice Chancellor, currently he is the Vice Chancellor of Guru Ghasi Das Vidyalaya, Central University, Bilaspur. Sir has qualification MCOM PhD from Oxford University and Morimur uh, College University in India. He has total experience about 29 years plus of experience in higher education institutions. Sir has admi administrative experience also 17 years. Sir has LEAP program in NEPA, University of Oxford, leadership program of MHRD, NEPA and Oxford University. Sir has area of specialization management, accounting, finance, marketing and research. Sir has research experience 25 year plus, uh, PhD uh, guide, PhD working, MPhil guide and many more. Sir has many publications. He has published uh, more than 14 books, research paper, monograph, popular article. Sir is also involved in a, a international and national editorial board. Uh, sir has also achievement in very gold medalist, uh, more than three gold medal graduation and post graduation in 
eight national and international awards. Sir is also the part of PA team member in National Assessment and Accreditation Council and KCG. Uh, has, sir has also life member in Indian Accounting Association and Indian Commerce Association. Sir has global exposure USA, UK, China and many more. Uh, sir has important position held in the past and present like SEBI nominated PR director and also UGC net JRF coordinator in uh, Saurashtra University Rajkot. Sir has many awards and honors like best paper award in international seminar section, national conference in Indian Accounting Association and Accounting Education, and also outstanding research paper award in international conference. Uh, sir has many achievements, many awards, very small span of time. I'm not able to read all those things. In this regard, I request to Alok Chakrawal, sir, please deliver the lecture. Over to you, sir. Please, sir. Uh, thank you, Ruchi ji, for giving such an elaborate uh, introduction of mine. The very first thing I would express my sincere gratitude to Professor S. G. Sharma ji, Director, National Assessment and Accreditation Council, for giving me an opportunity to interact with uh, uh, such a, a huge, august uh, uh, group of academicians. I'm thankful to Professor uh, Ami Kumar Radji who is the senior advisor uh, at uh, NAC, and he is looking uh, uh, in the back of, of uh, entire such kind of happening. Rather, is the backbone of uh, present working of NAC. I am sure Punmodi Raji is somewhere, and he is a very close friend, so I am thankful to him also. The entire NAC team, I am really thankful. Dear friends, I am not going to share the PPT, because in the morning I had some kind of, you know, clumsy experience and while sharing the PPT, sometimes it's moving, some, sometimes it's not moving. So better I'll keep myself audible to all of you. And in case if you need, I'll be sharing my PPT to the NAC authority and they'll be sending it to all of you. First thing. The most important thing about this uh, National Education Policy 2020 is that in real terms, Chakravan. this is uh, Chakravan, this is a revolution. This is very low. Please speak loudly. A little bit made you a uh, little bit uh, loud, sir. Just a moment. Am I audible properly now? Yeah, audible, sir. But if, if your volume is going to a little bit high, it's comfortable more. Oh, good. I'm trying to do it uh, as much as possible. How is it now? It's okay, fine with all of you? Fine, sir. Is that fine with all of you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, in, in, in online, you know, uh, kind of interaction, such kind of, you know, uh, glitches and hitches and kind of, you know, discomfort is very much, you know, um, normal. The very first and foremost important thing is that this uh, national education policy 2020 is a game changer for India in all respects. In anywhere across the globe, when Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji was there in, in United States and everybody was talking, number of you know global media were talking about uh, 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 this national education policy 2020. Now, the scope of today's discussion is I'll be talking about multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary education, academic bank of credit, skill development, uh, uh, integration of Indian languages, outcome-based education, and distance education and online education, whether you can, rather you can call it ODL. And the very first thing is that, I mean, uh, so in the very beginning of National Education Policy 2020, it is mentioned that we are moving towards multidisciplinary education system. Uh, here in this education policy, at many places you will see that it, it, it talks about setting up Meru universities, multidisciplinary educational and research university, which is the target of this education system, this uh, um, uh, education policy. And silos are going to be broken out, uh, but it does not mean that we are going to be totally disciplinless 
we are going totally out of the faculty and we are not having any kind of a specialization. It's all uh, something like, you know, T-shaped education. Now, T-shaped education is what, what there in, in this national education policy. Now, T-shaped means there is, a, uh, there is a horizontal line and there is a vertical line. Now, vertical, uh, vertical dimension that explains the specialization you are uh, intending to, you are going in, in some direction where you'll be having some specialization of pure science, applied science, commerce, engineering, arts, or something like that. But at the same time, there is a, uh, a, a horizontal line. Now, horizontal line talks about, you know, you are crossing your specialization. Maybe you are a student of science, but you are thinking of uh, going and having music music or performing art or, or fine arts for your, you know, completion of complete uh, credits of, you know, awarding certain degree. Maybe you are aspiring to go for undergraduate degree and say, for example, you require 150 credits. So for acquiring 150 credits, you are going for multidisciplinary education and degree. So there you are having a scope, you are having a freedom to move. Now, what is the vision of this education policy in terms of higher education institutions. Now, the very clear vision is that providing access, equity, quality of education. Now, access to everyone. So we keep on talking about inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Now, this education policy talks in real sense about the inclusion of the last man. So everybody is having the access whether he is living in village or urban or semi-urban or very distant remote place, they all are having access to the higher education. Equity means the quality of education will not be differently provided to poor and rich people. They all are having equal access and the quality of education will be really of very high uh, you know, level. Now, improving teaching learning uh, uh, system with the technology. Now, COVID itself, the, of course, the uh, 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 new education, national education policy was, draft was placed before the uh, masses in 2019 itself, but it was finalized uh, in July 2020. But, uh, but this uh, 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 pandemic or COVID-19 has taught us how to live with the technology, how to go in the blended learning mode, or how to be virtual. So here, this higher education uh, uh, system, I mean, this education policy talks about how to blend with the technology in, in higher learning. So here, teaching and learning process will be blended with the technology where you are going to use and have a complete infrastructure of what you call in uh, information and technology and communication uh, uh, system. And it is attributed to the knowledge creation. We are not going to be only cognitive about certain things, what we have been learning from the past. The, those are the knowledge of the bunch of knowledge which has already been created in the past. This education policy talks about creating some new knowledge for the future, generation and even for the present generation so we have to do brainstorming we have to create something and do, we don't have to rely upon very old raw, rotten kind of system we have to have something new innovation ecosystem is is the prime focus of this education policy we have not to rely upon other countries for doing innovations we are going to have an ecosystem have an environment have a supportive and conducive environment where we are posed to where we are supposed to where we are you know determined and destined to do innovations for the betterment of the economy and the education system and the overall society at large of the country called india capacity building and competencies are also in the focus of uh, this policy and research outcomes. That's most important thing. Most, I mean, what has been happening with the researches, what we had been doing in the past, those resources were, you know, put in the stack and hardly they were used after, you know, completion of, you know, PhD degree or MPhil degree or even, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you are doing some project based, you know, researches. I don't know how far we are really utilizing the outcomes of those researches. But here, 
this education policy talks about something you do the researches which are useful for the society and they have not to be in the cells of the library or in the cells of the researcher here these are the things so these are the uh, you know a uh, vision of a uh, uh, national education policy now strategy for becoming successful uh, uh, in implementing our uh, 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 national education policy 2020 is that we need to go for global network i mean we are putting we are creating a network oh, for uh, learning uh, am i audible some of voices is coming uh, is that fine with uh, sir, I request sir, you are very much uh, I request to other participants, please unmute yourself. Please mute yourself. Sir, please carry on. Uh, thank you, Ruchi ji. I, I will need your prompting after every five minutes that things are going well. Otherwise, it will be a kind of, you know, very uh, monotonous exercise for me. So anyways, I'm going again for the, for the talk. So strategies are that we need to have a global networking. Now global networking for what? Global networking for learning resources, infrastructure, knowledge creation, strategic alliance, technology enabled learning. These are the strategic planning, e-content and resource-based learning. Now, see, we when we are talking about inclusiveness, when we are talking about that, we have to reach till the last man. So we have certainly, uh, we are supposed to certainly go on uh, online uh, learning or blended mode of learning, where certain things are available from the cloud-based technology, where certain things are available in the uh, you know web technology, and certain things are you know available at the local resources. And we need to do a research collaboration for the risk, better research outcomes and for effective research outcomes and for effective research uh, propagation. So demand-driven yes. program, now, this is very important thing. I'm using this word again, demand-driven programs, oblique courses. Now, these are the things which are the very, uh, very, uh, you know, core features of this policy, NEP 2020. Now, you cannot force a student that we are offering this program and you have to take admission. No. A student is having, I mean, this, uh, I'll come in a little bit later on, uh, Academic Bank of Credit. Now, this education policy provides uh, the opportunity to a student that if a student is willing to have degree from multiple institution, he can have may he can have a degree from uh, say distance of institutions means of course degree will be from one institute, but he can pursue the courses from X institute, Y institute. Say for example, a student is 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 intended to have some courses on uh, footwear technology. Now, footwear technology courses are offered by uh, some institute, which is run by the government of India in Chandigarh. At the same time, he wants to uh, earn some courses from I am Calcutta or I am. Um, uh, code. At the same time, he is willing to have some courses from IIT Bombay or Rurki. At the same time, he is willing to have some courses from uh, uh, Delhi University or uh, Osmania University or some other Jamia Millia Islami. So, a student is having the option or the kind of, you know, opportunity to earn courses from different inst institutes and then further integrate them all in a one degree kind of thing. And there will be a degree awarding institution. If somebody is getting some confusion out of my lecture, you please keep it noted on your pen and pad and the end, by the end of this discussion, I'll be clarifying everything, everything. So see uh, uh, the, the, the options to the students like you have have 50,000 odd number of colleges in the, across the country. You have 1,000 number of universities across the countries. And it is proposed that every district level, at least one university will be open in the format of Meru. So you can imagine down the line coming, down the line 10 years or five years, how many good universities will be coming to the system. And a student will be having better prospect and opportunities to opt for the courses and programs. So here, what is in demand? We are not going to, uh, uh, there is a connect of, you know, degree and uh, industry. There is a connect of industry and academia interface that I'll be talking a bit later on. But here, uh, uh, the, the first thing is that, uh, uh, that you will be offering those programs and courses which are in demand. This is the key feature of this uh, 
national education policy and this is the strategy of this now active industry and academy uh, interface now uh, since i had my own experiences from the corporate sector because since i have worked for a pretty long time in the corporate sector so i used to meet people at Fiki platform at the Chamber of Commerce at different you know national and international uh, meets of corporate bodies. They used to tell me, Dr. Chakrawal, you are coming from the academic background, and our problem is that we are not getting employable graduates. The graduates are not having employability skills and qualities. So why they were not having employability skills and qualities? Because they were not taught what was demanded by the industry or what is demanded by the industry is not in our curricula and syllabi. So that was that was a problem. And we see most of the time, I mean, the reality is that whosoever is listening to me, you all know what is the fact. We say that we are, we are putting some people uh, from the industry on the board of studies on, a, on an academic council or something like that. I tell you, very few institutes are honest in, you know, nominating or co-opting people from industry or uh, the practical field. So we are hardly taking benefits of the people who are running the industry. So uh, we need people. We are, uh, see, I, I can give you one example. Aditya uh, Birla, uh, 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 a person who has given huge, huge economic support to Thailand. Why can't we take benefit of such kind of people here in India? Why I'm taking Aditya Birla? Because he has done it. Uh, uh, this group, Aditya Birla group. Kumar Mangla Birla is, is uh, we can talk about him. So, here that there, there has to be an academia and a active interface with the industry and technology incubation. So we need to have the uh, uh, this orientation of technology incubation and that is again further strategy. Uh, uh, now the imperative uh, imperative of this NEP is that uh, a skill and knowledge will go side by side. You know knowledge and a skill you cannot divide. Now, the, we have to uh, bridge the gap of education and employment. So if a person is educated, he is, uh, he is destined to have employment in the respective field. We are not going to offer any kind of degree which is not going to fetch any kind of economic emolument and benefit to the candidacy and probably phase number eight uh, it is very clearly mentioned in, in, in the NEP 2020 that uh, the, uh, the motive and objective of this education policy is to produce well-rounded graduates. Now, what is the meaning of well-rounded graduate? Now, well-rounded graduate is the person after graduating from an institution, a college or the university, uh, a graduate is capable of leading his financial and social life successfully. He is capable of becoming a very responsible citizen of the society. What was the situation in olden system that, you know, after completing graduation, automatically a student will go for post graduation, then we'll go, we'll go for ample degree, then we'll go for some PGDBM or PGDC or some kind of, you know, diploma program, then we'll go for PhD. By the time a student is either of 35 or 40 years age, and there is a lot of frustration and there is no employment at all. And that that creates a lot of trouble in the society. So we are targeting the gap of employment. We need quality employment citizenship and develop key behavioral skills. Now, see, we are training you. See, when we are training you, when we are giving you education, you should have interpersonal behavioral skills and effectively applying the concepts. Whatever you have learned, you need to you know, apply in the society. It should not be a kind of a stack and kind of, you know, outdated things for all of us and imbibe higher level of understanding that is the that is the uh, imperative of this uh, uh, NEP 2020 and learning approach has to be developed and innovation and creativity that's the core of it and excellence excellence and excellence that is what we are looking and talent transformation so uh, these are the things and now let us see what was happening i mean here i mean behaviorism that was missing and only cognitivism. No, we are talking about constructivism. We are talking about metacognitivism. And this education policy is learner-centric, but not the teacher-centric. 
it is not like that what we are willing to teach we will teach we have to look that what is the student uh, 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 aspiration what what is the ultimate demand of the student and accordingly we have to plan out we have to satiate the hunger of a student say if a student is very much you know uh, uh, oriented and uh, oriented and very much you know having motivated for theological learning so we need to have a, a program on theological uh, schools and uh, the kind of you know religious learning and all that it's all depending and everything is in Nepal you cannot say there are good number of temples across the country in the world you can go for the temple management courses why don't we offer that so we have to create programs according to the thirst and hunger and motivation and desire of the students and here this education policy talks about cooperative learning but not the individual learning earlier we were more concentrating on individual learning it's talking about collaborative and participatory learning so discovery of learning is the more most important aspect of this and non-linear approach we are not moving in same direction sometimes moving left sometimes we are moving in direct uh, right direction so what ultimately is happening the ha is that we are looking at I request all of you, please. <laughs> uh, Raj Saab, is it going well? Uh, fine with at your end? Yeah, yeah, fine, 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 fine. Please go ahead. So uh, we were talking about that this education policy doesn't talk about linear learning, right? Uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, it's non-linear and we have to move like that. Now, uh, education policy, this education policy lays particular emphasis on the development of the creative potential of the individual and it, it, it does not only, you know, base emphasis on com uh, cognitive capacities like literacy, numeracy, and higher order thinking. So there is much many more things than that. that that's what I would. So uh, uh, here the most important feature which has come out of uh, this education policy is academic bank of credit. In the month of March 2021, uh, the University Grants Commission has, has uh, put a complete draft of academic bank credit on its portal. On July 29th, 2021, uh, Honorable Prime Minister of India, uh, Sri Narendra Modi ji, inaugurated academic bank of credit on first uh, 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 one year completion, first anniversary of declaration of national education policy 2020. Now, what is a academic bank of credit? Let us understand. Uh, uh, academic Bank of Credit uh, uh, permits a student to uh, earn a degree, uh, rather, you know, pursue his courses from uh, multiple institutions. The Academic Bank of Credit will allow uh, participation of institution in this uh, new concept of, uh, you know, uh, teaching learning. Uh, uh, I'll not talk about merits and all that later on. First, I'll give you the uh, what is the mechanism, how it works, and how it, is, it will be working in future. So, uh, uh, right now, there is a provision that only A grade institution can participate in academic bank of credit or also uh, uh, national institutional ranking framework, top 100 institution. That's the permission given. But in future, government may think of you know modifying this uh, condition. We do not know what will happen because we were talking at central level, university level, something about this. So we will be talking, we'll be discussing that later on. Here, uh, the academic bank of credit uh, permits a student that a student uh, can uh, have um, uh, his courses from multiple institutions. Now, uh, as a student will open his uh, academic bank of credit account via a, 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 a university or uh, higher education institutions. Say, for example, uh, a student wants to pursue his courses through Academic Bank of Credit. So, uh, say, for example, the University of Delhi uh, is a participating institution in Academic Bank of Credit, so uh, he can get registered at uh, Delhi University. 
Now, say for example, for completing a graduation course or earning sufficient credit of a graduation course, a student is supposed to uh, earn uh, 150 credits or uh, uh, say uh, 30 courses he has to perceive. So under this academic bank of credit, a student will have to perceive at least is from the host institution where he is getting registered himself for getting degree awarded. Say, for example, University of Delhi. Now, rest of the uh, 50 to 70 percent courses he will pursue from different other institutions. Like uh, uh, he can opt from uh, uh, Jamia Bilia Islamia, he can uh, do some courses from Savitri Bhai Phule uh, University, he can do some courses from, from uh, Gurghasi Dash Vishwajitara, he can do some courses from from uh, uh, Madras University, Christ University, uh, uh, some other institutions. So, uh, uh, by uh, while earning all these, you know, credits, his credits are being deposited in an academic bank of credit. Say he is uh, uh, pursuing a course, uh, say in uh, cotton and textile. So, cotton and textile. Say he has earned four credits by pursuing this course from Guru Ghasidas Vishwavidyalaya. So, after he has earned four credits, Guru Ghasidas Vishwavidyalaya deposit his credits in academic bank of credit in his account. So, uh, gradually the boy or the girl will be earning courses or completing uh, credits or earning credits from various institutes. Once the student has earned sufficient number of credits from various institutes, the student will go to the host institution. Like the, I, I, as I told you in the beginning, Delhi University. He will go or she will go to the Delhi University and will request the university for awarding the degree. Now for, uh, for initiation of the award of the degree, uh, University of degree, uh, Delhi will request academic bank of credit for redeeming all the credits of the students and all credits will be transferred to the Delhi University. And if Delhi University finds that uh, all, uh, you know, required credits are available now, then Delhi University can permit, can grant, can award the degree to the student, confer the degree on the students uh, in respect to say, if the majority of the subjects are science, the university can think of giving Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of uh, Commerce or Bachelor of uh, uh, or B.Tech or something like that. Now, there is a provision also. Say, for example, if you cannot decide what is the discipline of the student. In, the, in that case, the university uh, can award the degree uh, in, in the name of Bachelor of Liberal Education. Now, BLE, that's a new uh, nomenclature, Bachelor of Liberal Education can be awarded to the student. So this is how a student will be earning the, deg earning the degree. Academic Bank of Credit is going like this. Now, as I told you that there is a compulsion that the institutions, higher education institutions must be A grade institutions. They should not be less than A grade. Say for example, today I am pursuing a course from one institution. The institution is A grade institution, but tomorrow this institution gets converted into B grade institution. Now, in that case, uh, the institution will lose its membership from academic bank of credit and it can offer uh, uh, no more uh, this uh, courses associated with ABC. Now, the question comes how the seats will be, you know, offers, uh, offered. Now, there is a provision of providing extra seats uh, in all programs and courses uh, uh, for the institution whichever is participating in academic bank of credit. Say for example, Guru Ghasi Vishwavidyalaya is participating in academic bank of credit and I am, see, I can offer my entire program, I can offer my certain, you know, courses, this is the freedom to the institution. So either the program or the courses, whatever has been offered under ABC system, we are having freedom to add 20% supernumerary seats to that. Now, that supernumerary seats will be offered to the students who are going for academic bank of credit. Now, further, these courses, these programs can be run in any of the mode. This can be run in online mode. Then this can be run in offline mode. Even 
स्वयं कोर्सेज और एनपीटेल कोर्सेज और एनी सच काइंड ऑफ कोर्सेज कैन ऑल्सो बी कंसिडर फॉर द अवार्ड ऑफ डिग्री अंडर एकेडमिक बैंक ऑफ क्रेडिट एंड दीज क्रेडिट कैन बी ट्रांसफर टू द एकेडमिक बैंक ऑफ क्रेडिट सो दिस ट्वेंटी परसेंट सीट विल बी अवेलेबल विद each and every institution which are going to participate in academic bank of credit i'm sure there must be a lot of questions arising in your mind so we can discuss all those questions later on uh, when we are discussing uh, we are, when we are going for question and answer session uh, now mechanism is that uh, after earning the credit a student can carry it i mean a student can retain this credit up till 7 years Up till seven years can uh, retain it, and uh, uh, after seven seven years expiry, I mean there is no modality has yet come. But here that this range is for from you know uh, this depends upon. Sometimes an institution can decide that it may be for five years or three years or four years or six years. The maximum limit is seven year. While pursuing a course or program, a student is having freedom. of entering a course and exiting from the course so this is in real sense going to be multiple entry and multiple exit program so a student is having say for example a student has earned certificate uh, 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 um, uh, for a particular program so if he is having certificate course and he has earned the certificate say for example income tax consultant or income tax filing or maybe you know uh, uh, foods and nutrition expert or dietitian expert so after earning a certificate program a student can go in the field can do the practice can earn a lot of money and like what is happening in in foreign country so here you are having freedom to go and practice in the field and there after certain period you can come and join again the program so you are having all freedom to join any time to have this program at any time and you can exit also but at the same time uh, every institution will have its own set of you know rules and regulations how Uh, the modality will go sop standard operating practices for all uh, such kind of admissions and uh, uh, relieving from the institutions uh, there are a lot of uh, many other things you know in this and uh, as in the national education policy 2020 it is become mandatory for all institutions that they will have to go for accreditation either by nac or any other institution which has been you know uh, uh, accorded by by the government of india or the ministry of education or maybe nac will be somewhere in the process which is going to give you know permission to independent institutions to go for uh, institutional accreditation so this is how it is working this is how it is going to work like that there are a lot many other things in about academic bank of credit we can talk upon but uh, i think abc we will be concluding here because lot many other things has to be discussed uh, benefits are there lot of benefits we, we can talk about that but uh, now the important thing is that this education system this education policy talks a lot about uh, uh, you know uh, skill development so we we are going to uh, talk about uh, uh, how this skill development uh, will uh, take place and how it is going to have the policy envisaged uh, uh, sorry the policy envisioned the holistic development of youth with emphasis on not only an upsurge in gross enrollment ratio but right. also imparting right. of skills as a key element of modern education system skill based yeah, education ye bata rahe ho certificate hai should be part of higher education and it should not be restricted to iti and polytechnics i think uh, this is a very good move that because of skill development uh, we will find that there is a, a, a big jump uh, in gross enrollment ratio what we are targeting 50% gross enrollment ratio by 2035 that will be possible if we are going to uh, inculc uh, see embed this skill development as part of our uh, uh, courses uh teaching should include more practical object research based training that is 50% theory and 50% pra practical now theory and practical should be linked it should not be like that so uh, what happens sometimes you know like uh, in commerce education we are teaching uh, income tax but 
hardly students are given the practical exposure. They are doing some prototype, you know, examples in the classroom, doing some numericals, and thereafter they are, you know, given good marks. Not like that. You have to go and literally file, you know, several forms and other income tax returns, and you have to file, you know, uh, a refund of the income tax and all that. So 50% practical and 50% theory, they have to be linked with, say for example, we are giving theory of income tax and asking the student to go for GST practical, that is also not correct. The practical and theory should be. So if I'm teaching the theory of GST, I should teach the practical of GST. If I'm teaching the theory of income tax, I should teach the practical of uh, theory of uh, uh, income tax. Analytical learning should be propagated irrespective of the subject. So any subject, analytic learning, I mean, uh, we have not to make them a kind of, you know, the student stereotype learner and they have to believe what we are saying. I mean, the students should have their freedom to uh, interact with all kind of, you know, critical analysis and um, um, uh, critical, um, you know, observations of their own on any subject and topic, whatever is being interacted in the classroom. And project-based research training for the student, especially in master's courses, irrespective of the subject. So, uh, we know now we are proposing one year master degree program. Now in one year master degree program also, masters should always be uh, given a project based uh, course uh, uh, where, you know, research orientation and training is embedded in that and that will, uh, you know, uh, uh, enhance the uh, skill related to research or data analysis or project finalization and all that. So here, this is the part of the skill development. Vocational courses are under the spotlight now in a bid to make Indian youth skillful and employable. I mean, earlier I told you that there's a lot of gap between the uh, uh, skills required and what we are teaching. Maybe we are not teaching skills at all sometimes, you know, in certain courses. I'm not talking in general sense, but maybe uh, we need to, you know, uh, look at ourselves. Uh, we have to revisit uh, how and what we are doing. So therefore, there is a revived approach towards running vocational courses, which are being offered by various institutes of higher learning in the country. The undergraduate vocational courses are pivotal in producing skilled graduates in tune with the industrial revolution 4.0 means when we are talking of knowledge economy, when we are talking about, we have passed a, a IT revolution, we are now heading towards knowledge economy, and that is a new uh, level of industrial revolution. With the vision to make the youth art neighbor through skill-based education, introducing the vocational subjects and training at schools, school level too. So uh, uh, 10th and 12th level also, vocational training will start and rather, you know, government is, uh, different state governments have already started, you know, making kind of alteration in their curricula and kind of, you know, teaching learning uh, procedures. NAP 2020 provides that even the students of middle level shall be exposed to hands-on training in vocational skills like carpentry. As I told you, some certain schools have already started, certain states have also already started. Carpentry, plumbing, electrical repairing, horticulture, pottery, embroidery. I mean, I mean, we can keep on taking names and on and on and on. The policy has set the target of providing vocational skills to at least 50% students by 2025 in such a way that the vocational skills acquired at a school level may be further extended up to higher education level depending upon the requirement of individual students. <clears throat> the workforce is growing substantially. In 2011, India had a workforce of 47.79 crores, which increased to 50.24 crores in 2017. However, as per the 12th plan, 85% of the workforce has educational qualification up to secondary level only. 50 percent has educational qualification up to primary level and nearly 2% of the workforce has vocational training. Now see, this is the, this is the irony. Only 2% of the workforce are having vocational training. Or sometimes if they are trained, they are trained in a traditional manner and maybe they are not able to, you know, 
respond to the data survey that we are vocationally trained. As per 2014 data, our data survey data. Is there any observation from the participants, sir? Uh, well, is there any Luchi observation yeah. from the part? Uh, well, <laughs> Rupa Majit, if you have some question, you can ask me later Rupa by the end of uh, this session. You can ask me later. In admin, mute everyone, mute everybody except. Yes, sir. Somebody, somebody is asking uh, which aspects are to be implemented by Guru Gasi Das As a vice chancellor, I'm saying you, uh, this is my commitment. We are going to implement 100% uh, of the policy in total by the coming year and certain portion have already been implemented from this year. So that these are the question and session we'll be talking later on. So uh, let's concentrate on what we are talking right near, right now. So as per 2014 data on 4.0 lakh seats available for apprenticeship, about 2.8 lakh apprentices were trained according to the India Skills Report 2018. More than 12 million people between the ages of 15 and 29 years are expected to enter India's workforce every year, leading to an about 600 million workforce by 2022. However, by 2022, a more skilled workforce of 109 million would be required in 24 key sectors of the economy. So the, why I'm reading all this, these are the skill, I mean, because data are always delaying. So the report is published, you know, two, three years later. So the latest data is available or two of is of 2018. So that I'm taking here. These figures and trends show two clear challenges that India is facing. Firstly, the workforce that is entering the market does not have the required skills. Secondary, secondly, the skilled workforce does not have the relevant skills as is evident from the data in India Skill Report 2018, which says that the employability of technically skilled workforce has increased from 33.95% in 2014 to 45.60% in 2018. Excuse me. <clears throat> Another key challenge is that as per the said report, from the current distribution of the workforce between unorganized sector and organized sector at 92% and 8% respectively, it will change slightly 90% and 10% respectively in 2022. Now, this is the irony. Only 10% is in organized sector, 90% in unorganized sector. This means that the unorganized sector will continue to power India's skilled workforce demand, which will essentially require people with education up to secondary and sec uh, senior secondary levels to be skilled and even non-technical graduates to be skilled in the relevant and focused area. And that is why, see, the education policy targets that even in the early age also or the middle age also, the students will be learning certain skills which are going to be demanded in the market. So uh, uh, higher education, sometimes, you know, people feel like that, that higher education is a must for everyone. No, uh, in Europe and America, it is not a must for everyone. People, you know, think about their requirement and, ability, you know, kind of, you know, liking and disliking. Everyone is not going for higher education. Higher education is something when you look for that, you know, you need a higher learning. Higher learning and degree, somewhere they were not connected in the past. Now higher learning and degree are going to be connected. Now, skill gap concerns for the industry. Now, this is what has been, you know, uh, uh, going on. So 
Now, how you are having uh, your abilities to grow for uh, having better and better skills and uh, how we can go for talent transformation, deliver products, service on time, meet quality standards and meet environmental and social requirements. These are very important aspects of, uh, of the society in terms of uh, uh, NEP 2020. One <laughs> defining feature of the NEP 2020 is it's focused on promotion of Indian languages. Now, uh, integrating Indian languages. So now trilingual is a practice which is going to be and very interesting thing is that I tell you recently AICT has approved eight Indian languages to run technical education. Now uh, 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 it's focus on promotion of Indian languages, arts and culture. That's a very important thing. A language is not just word. It's a culture, a tradition a unification of a community, a whole history that creates what a community is. It's all embodied in a language. In order to promote art and culture, it is very important to promote Indian languages. India is a country with languages changing every 15 to 20 miles, according to native communication style. People in India talk to each other in their native language or you can call vernacular language or colloquial language which also shows their culture and tradition through their languages <clears throat> without the promotion of languages it is not possible to promote art in the form of film plays literature music etc in order to preserve and promote culture one must preserve and promote its languages. Culture is linked to a house and the language is the door. India has lost 220 languages in the last 50 years alone. And the UNESCO has declared 197 Indian languages as endangered. So see the seriousness that we have already lost uh, uh, 200 plus you know, languages and 197 or close to 200 are uh, uh, about to die. The promotion of Indian language will be integrated into school and higher education at every level. Primary learning through native public mother tongue develops the cognitive abilities of a child and eases the process of acquiring basic literacy skills and understanding complex concepts compared to those who are taught in their second language. In order to help students learn these languages, there will be ensured availability of high quality learning materials in the form of workbooks, textbooks, magazines, videos, poems, plays, novels, etc. All sort of content will be available in your local language or the vernacular languages. Moreover, the language must have a consistent update to their vocabulary in the dictionary so that the students can be provided with education in terms of, in terms of the latest topics and issues of the country. The languages of India, along with their art and culture, will be documented through the online portals, web, and wikis to preserve the native languages and their knowledge. So these these are the these are the proposed things. Certain things have already started taking place. These platforms will consist of dictionaries, videos, recordings, people. I mean. Now, see, people are going to be part of the language. Like, you know, like, you know, very knowledgeable people in our vicinity who are having treasure of the language, uh, especially elders, and speaking, uh, they are speaking the language, reciting poetry, telling stories, and performing folk songs, plays, <laughs> dance, and much more. So, uh, I tell you, uh, 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 in certain reasons, because I have experience that, you know, people who are having treasure of their traditional language and culture, they are being honored and their stories being uh, being you know 
codified their stories being you know documented uh, in 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 virtual form and physical form also the general public uh, the general public possessing at a high level knowledge of the language will also be invited to contribute to the portal and add their own learning resources these web portals will be managed by the universities and their research teams and will be funded by the ne uh, nrf that is national research foundation <clears throat> the policy also stated the introduction of e courses in eight major regional languages instead of limiting the e content to hindi and english e courses will be developed in tamil telugu kannada malayalam gujarati marathi odia and bengali more higher educational institutions and more programs in higher education will use the mother tongue or local language as a media of medium of instruction and offer programs bilingually so depending upon the situation and scenario so uh, that was about you know uh, integrating uh, languages uh, in the so we are you know concentrating and focusing on on the languages so one by one so multidisciplinary education uh, academic bank of credit multiple entry and exit and then uh, skill development and then languages now we are coming to online and digital digital education which is again a key feature of this education policy so technology enabled learning can not only bring in transformational change in online education experience it can also enhance and supplement regular classroom based pedagogy it could offer more flexibility and learning support than a traditional format so here why online and digital education so odia or distance learning when we are talking so here we when we talk about inclusion of everyone that is possible only when we are going to offer the courses through online and, and this is certainly going to boost the enrollment ratio gross enrollment ratio will be boosting by the online and distance learning education technology offers teachers the opportunity to become more collaborative and extend learning beyond classrooms educators could create learning communities comprising students fellow educators and experts in various disciplines around the world <clears throat> so uh, uh, when we are talking about digital learning that includes online learning blended learning e learning virtual learning and virtual university and skill development universities so where we we talk about digital digitization of uh, 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 learning and all that now we have about outcome based education now uh, in 2013 i got a, a project from britain i mean we had been talking about i mean nat has al always been very much particular about asking what is the outcome of the program outcome of the course outcome of the a uh, 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 particular degree but hardly we could you know make a kind of attempt to understand what is outcome the outcome is something which is related with your dissemination of teaching what are you delivering in the classroom say for example uh, a boy is uh, perceiving a uh, 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 a course of uh, uh, spanish guitar so say after 6 months of a course of spanish guitar he should be able to play the guitar say in the first week if the teacher is teaching how to tune the guitar he should be capable of tuning the guitar guitar after a weeks training or after a weeks you know uh, you know teaching i'm i'm giving you an example this example may be you know instrumentation or any kind of thing whatever you are teaching say so after it it's directly say for example a boy or a girl is pursuing llb program now after completing llb program the student should be capable of pleading a case in the court of law and if he is not able to 
plead the case in the court of law, somewhere the program outcome is missing. It means the boy or the girl has not been properly taught or he has not learned it properly while sitting in the classroom. Now, here is the problem. Problem is of assessment and evaluation. We have to move from evaluation to the assessment. So assessment will ensure that whether a student is earning the abilities, what is expected from the student. That's very important important and crucial thing. So I'll be coming a bit later on uh, in more detailing or uh, what is that? So outcome based education is a student centric teaching and learning methodology in which the courses courses are delivered. Assessments are planned to achieve stated objectives and outcomes. It focuses on measuring a student performance that is outcomes at different levels. So uh, what have you earned after uh, as I told you, see, if, you, if you're not earning, if you're not learning, if you're not able to deliver, then it means uh, the entire exercise of teaching you in the classroom was futile. We have to avoid futile exercise. So once I was visiting one university in UK, the name of the university I would like to mention here, uh, that is uh, Bath and Spa University. And it was a teacher's uh, uh, education degree. So uh, they were not uh, going for, uh, you know, terminal exams like, you know, a written paper examination after every six months or um, every co um, four months or, or uh, at the end of the year. But they were assessed by their students. They were assessed by their employers. They were assessed by their peers. They were assessed by their uh, parents. So the assessment was so tough. Say, for example, if I'm not able to teach in the classroom, say if it is the graphics, if it is the practical sums, if it is, you know, theoretical problems or numerical problems or whatever, if I'm not able to demonstrate a practical to my students who is in the laboratory of chemistry or physics or botany or geology, so it means I'm not qualified. So for getting qualified for that, you need to go for assessment, not for written examination. So here, uh, uh, we are targeting to certain level, not to certain level, very comprehensively we are talking, uh, targeting upon learning outcomes, program outcomes, program uh, based outcomes, you know, course based, course specific outcomes, you know, overall program outcomes. So the outcome means what you are expected, what you are supposed to learn by the program. And if you are not learning it, means you are missing the program and you are not fit for that. So uh, this, this targets about the skills, the, the skill which you are supposed to develop, knowledge, what uh, uh, something very virtual skill is physical, you may show the skill, the physical skill or virtual skill at the same time knowledge and behavior. Degree does not mean you have to become arrogant. So your interpersonal behavior, your interpersonal skill, how you are dealing with your peers, how you are dealing with the society, how you are dealing with your uh, uh, clients and your customer, your you know, um, uh, your subjects, the, those people where you are going to work upon, how you, is, is your behavior? So that is directly related with the learning outcome. Now, uh, uh, four things I would state here. What is object of outcome-based education? Now, outcome-based education is what the student should be able to do after completion of the program or the course. Outcome based education is what? What the student should be able to do. Now, this NEP 2020 talks about that. If the student is not able to perform, so some, something is missing. Now, how, what is outcome based curriculum? A curriculum will focus upon how to make the student achieve the outcome. So, uh, for that, curriculum has to be you know designed in a way that uh, content, uh, maybe practical, maybe theory, maybe um, um, uh, or something blending of that and outcome based teaching and learning. So constantly you have to watch, you have to watch very closely whether the student is earning the ability or acquiring the ability or acquiring the traits of the particular field. And uh, the last one is that outcome based assessment. Now outcome based uh, assessment is you are observing. Not only you are observing, as I told you, for a teacher, the students are, you know, giving feedback. They are giving the assessment and they are giving the appraisal and on the basis of that appraisal, a teacher is given the uh, degree of teacher. So, uh, 
what is an outcome an outcome is what the learner will be able to do or perform as a result of some learning experience i repeat an outcome is what the learner will be able to do or perform as a result of some learning experience in the context of formal education what we are going to deliver an outcome is what the student should be able to do at the end of a program or course or instructional unit outcomes provide the basis for an effective interaction among stakeholders so these are the things what we are looking for for the outcome now uh, for the level of our different outcomes we need to have a vision of the department or the institution we have to state our mission and we have to state program educational objectives program outcomes program specific outcomes and course outcomes so these things has to be stated so, so the nac has been talking about all these things since very long but now we have to do it very rigorously uh, so uh, there are many more things i think it's a uh, uh, quarter to four and we are having a lot of question answers um, piled up in the minds of my listeners so i can even uh, stretch it for further another maybe one hour two or whatever you like to talk but uh, i would rather you know uh, 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 go back to amir ji and ruchi tripathi ji for the interaction with my uh, participants thank you very much Ruchi ji, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Any, there are some questions I could see in the chat. Uh, importance of formative assessment has been emphasized. The assessment strategies should also be discussed, especially authentic assessment and continuous internal assessment structure be more innovative. Okay. NAC must arrange webinars on outcome-based education by experts rather than such. Okay, yeah. yeah there are, I mean, this is exclusively for uh, NEP implementations. Uh, I, th I think if anybody who wish, wish to give focus or give light on uh, NEP, if anybody wants to say anything, your observations regards to NEP, Yes, uh, sir. One question I want to ask regarding this. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Sir, you very yeah, nicely, please. very clearly, you uh, actually informed that local languages have been promoted in higher education scene. So, uh, any timeline has been set, sir, for this to have the local language because Chhattisgarh we have Chhattisgarh. All states have different local languages. So, uh, what is the timeline set for this? Because that is a big thing. Because that that's how. Are inter uh, actually interstate uh, sometimes a uh, lot of admissions are interstates so that will reflect on the because uh, local languages if it is so outside people will have a very big issue going in that state so that will actually change and uh, it will limit to the local uh, areas also so any time and set by the government for this uh, Mustafa ji as of now as for my information, so far the language is concerned, there is no timeline fixed. But uh, uh, it is up to the institution. They have already started implementing it. Like AICT has already granted permission to run the programs in eight Indian languages besides those two Hindi and English. Now, so now courses are being offered in 10 total different languages in India, technical education. Now universities and states are having their own uh, individual task forces to implement NEP 2020. So different states are having their different strategies so they can implement it as per their own priorities. Mm -hmm. That is the answer to your question. It's clear. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sir, a, Namaskar. Sir, there is a question. Uh, sir, my, my, yes, one thing I would like to clear. Uh, in National Education Policy 2020, there is a multiple exit options are there so in the third undergraduate courses for the three years and the four years are there so after in the fourth fourth year the multidisciplinary aspect is mentioned there 
after one year it is certificate course is there second year diploma third year degree and fourth year the multidisciplinary what does it actual meaning of the multidisciplinary concept is there in the fourth year for undergraduate courses i think uh, i need to clarify here sir shivaswa ji 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 uh, it's not exactly like that right yes the student has a freedom to choose from the very first year right now now very first year you are going to offer the kind of you know uh, you can offer vocational uh, courses you can offer some kind of you know courses which are going to enable a student to practice certain things in the practical field and that is why we are going to provide practical uh, certificate program certificate to the student after two years the boy is given diploma uh, degree and after three years normal undergraduate degree is given now all these are multidisciplinary i tell you now what is fourth year now fourth year they may offer in uh, uh, honors they may offer in uh, multidisciplinary teachers education they are they may offer it as a research degree so there are different different provisions and you know after four years you are having the freedom to join research program directly right yes, yes, so yes, if yes, you yes. are having research degree you can join directly the research program right if you have gone for multidisciplinary teacher education you are eligible to become a teacher if you are having honors program maybe specialized in pure science area applied science area uh, 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 engineering sector or whatever so that will be attributed to that right so uh, see this is completely uh, uh, barrierless uh, kind of degree and uh, as i while well, i was talking about uh, academic bank of credit i told you about a bachelor in uh, liberal education that is yes. the degree where you cannot decide what is the nomenclature of degree so you can offer bachelor in liberal <laughs> education also so shivaswa sir uh, with yes. due respect uh, this is not uh, the way you mentioned it is something different okay thank you sir thank you uh, uh, there is a comment from uh, 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 bk pani grahi ji that nac must arrange webinars on outcome based education by experts rather than such script based lectures by these dear sir this is not script based lecture. this is personal experience find it i am making elaborate explanations to find you need certain clarification you can ask me directly i think this is somewhat a good comment from your side mr panigrai dr chakarwal i have a small question yeah please yeah my name is dr vikas i am vice chancellor at itm university raipur sir my question is regarding the yeah please uh, the direction of collaboration you know like it is a uh, very uh, like thought process in the new education policy that there should be collaboration between universities within the country also and also outside the you know country so my question is regarding uh, a very specific point like can courses also be shared like if if a program has say 40 courses can we share courses also complete courses under the collaboration like let's say we know there is a good university say in architecture and we would like some of their faculty to uh, take a particular course complete course as a visiting faculty maybe using the online mode because online is also allowed now so is it permitted that we can have collaboration a signed mou a good collaboration and then inviting their faculty members to take up the complete courses including the assessment part sir uh uh dr vikas ji uh, that's a very wonderful question to me i mean uh, a very intelligent person can only ask such kind of question uh a straight away answer to from my side is yes you can there are modalities we can talk about the modality how it can be uh, but yes it can be thank you so much sir thank you so much yeah yeah it can be Uh, so what I do, there are 
there are many many kind of comments i'll i'll coming comments uh, uh because that way i'll be able to make it more clear uh what uh, people could not because you know we have to cover certain area and those those things are very precisely uh, you know prescribed by so we go accordingly uh, uh some is talking about uh, professor vk basbe ji that abc will be more effective if uh, registration is allowed to all accredited institution to be commensurate with the binary accreditation i think that's a good suggestion from uh from mr deepak ji find this speech in youtube now that you have to talk to nac people i don't know if they are going to upload this in the youtube uh, platform and uh, uh, somebody different uh, question let me see so uh, or uh, 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 well um, not uh, kind of uh, there's some praise of word uh, bridging words i mean importance of formative assessment has been emphasized assessment strategies should also be discussed especially authentic assessment and continuous assessment is structured more everybody yes of course why we are missing tracking because you know we have not been going for uh, 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 formative assessment now formative assessment is something which is going to inculcate the kind of qualities what we are looking in our graduate students so formative assessment is certainly going to help you for uh, skill development for the you know uh, the, uh, outcome learning for the uh, specific out outcome -based. so we have to say and i tell you when we are going for formative assessment of course formative assessment is very time taking and time consuming process and uh, it's a multi Multiple level and multiple, uh, you know, terminal, level, you know, kind of assessment. You see, in terminal examination, summative assessment, one person is evaluating that. No, it's not like that. There are many stakeholders. There are many assessors. There are many, you know, uh, few examiners who are going to contribute to your overall uh, grading. So we need to divide. We need to formulate something which is going to help us in in a complete sense of implementing perfect. system so this is what i think uh, if anybody else is having some remarks and comments uh, we certainly happy can you elaborate more about interdisciplinary aspect of nep where it could be reflecting in nac with percentage of value now see interdisciplinary uh, 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 kind of things you know nac is continuously updating its you know that's of uh, you know, different matrix of uh, accreditation assessment so i'm sure ki nac is in the process of incorporating and integrating nep uh, variables or nep uh, directives for a better accreditation of the institutions in the light of implementation of uh, nep in higher education so that is up to the nac level but so far as uh, of course Beginning also, I told you that we have found all the silos. Now you can offer a liberal degree. There are certain institutions which are offering a, a bachelor in arts in liberal uh, liberal arts or kind of you know uh, where they were not having a complete kind of demarcation. And even for very old time also, I mean maybe for ten years, fifteen years, I know these institutions. Like one uh, university is in Gandhi Nagar that is. Uh, pandit dindayal upadhyay petroleum university so they are offering such kind of degree for pretty long time in my understanding there are more other universities also which are offering such kind of degrees where there is no clear demarcation of those faculty and subjects and schools they are free opt for uh, any any kind of subject and they can go for the choice but means they are having a cafeteria approach they can choose pick and choose uh, different subjects and Courses from different different institutions. That is how planning to go for in NP. In in a school, uh, in the institution level also, it is possible that a student multiple you know uh, 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 options are, uh, to um, design or tailor their degrees uh, for pursuing. Uh, so this is what I think uh, that's all. Uh,
throw the light on skill development students by council like lsss bc new okay well as in the very beginning told me that uh, you can have, uh, add you from siam also so these you know institutions like uh, skill development uh, if they are offering some courses that can also be added for the graduation program you can pick one particular skill development program uh, sorry course add it to your uh, degree so i think uh, uh, there is no much from your side and i feel i should uh, you know uh, complete my discussion here it is only 2 minutes left in 4:30 so over to you rath ji and ruchi uh, now all session in your hands thank you very much sir may i speak yes ma'am zarur uh, thank you chakravarti yes. sir for your wonderful presentation yes ma'am sir hi yes so thank you so much uh, ruchi and uh, the team and net for giving me the opportunity to ask the question to the vice chancellor of ghazidas university sir uh, my question is for the skill development because the skill development is the need of the hour for um, graduating the graduate students so in that skill development is earlier it was but uh, now in a uh, pack ways uh, pack pattern uh, it is uh, run by the different organization different councils are there as we have the lss tc life skill Uh, life science skill development uh, uh, council is also there they are running the so many employable uh, courses in that so that is the need of the hour in the chatisgarh if the all the universities will uh, implement and the different other organizations they are also running the skill courses and it is very much useful for, to to that so if they are running and uh, uh, students are getting as a elective subject to them Uh, so one of the graduate course, as you rightly said, that the one of the uh, credit course, two course, uh, two credit or four credits. As I belongs to the pharmacy profession, so in our pharmacy council of India has given the four credits for uh, one uh, course. So that is and that is compulsory for the students. So that is the need. So they are making the students employable by industry practical training and by. Uh, professional in the pharmacy in the professional practices program the pharmacy practice what we are doing in the regulatory in the industry in the hospitals so so many things they are doing so it will be uh, how much it is uh, useful for our students it is really useful or uh, what they will do this council will do is it if any you have uh, experiences then you can share to us no what you are saying that's uh, 100% true and i think uh, institutions should think about uh, in implementation of this uh, uh, for a complete you know leverage of this policy so then only we will be implementing it in the right fashion so i think what you are saying that is correct i am agreeing to that please thank you so much yeah thank you sir चक्रवाली for a state like chatisgarh the regional cooperation and the inter university cooperation in developing the uh, value based courses and the holistic courses i think that is very important that may include some of the uh, programs of regional importance including the skill based program and i think in this direction what can be done uh, we would like to have of the sector well uh, i mean see strategy is to go i mean see we can integrate certain th things and uh, uh, well uh, uh, skill development or vocational training or uh, you know holistic education silo okay. broken education all these things you know we have to have a comprehensive implementation and here it is something 
uh, okay we are trying to pieces but somehow we have to have a holistic uh, approach to implement it start you know implementing it in pieces if you are part of it the student will be really uh, spellbound miserable condition this is what i feel uh, so we have to be uh, with a complete you know approach of implementing this education when we talk about cafeteria approaches we have to offer them when we talk about tellerman degrees we have to offer them and for that virtual infrastructure it infrastructure is very important i think like uh, 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 academic bank of credit still we are in the process of you know registering institutions you know offering the programs to the students it's a, a very comprehensive a very, very huge work very huge task to set up a virtual cloud based cloud based you know infrastructure to offer the degree to the students and we need a lot of technocrats and education experts to implement this we are doing it at our level uh, in whatever uh, you know uh, limited uh, um, uh, किसी को कुछ कहना है रिलेटेड टू एनी पी कोई सजेशन है ए, कोई i think uh, one thing one question i've got uh, let me let me clarify that uh, mr vinod uh, to everyone no, that's a question or something like that observation i would no, like no, to no. make a comment upon that a students who are in higher education are not, not meant for skill training no, no, no. into the bracket job higher education concept is linked to the government job i think ah, i took that misconception sir you need to uh, you know uh, rethink over uh, about your uh, comment, right uh, this is not the kind of thing <laughs> anyways anyone else uh may i ask uh, a question professor chakrawal yeah please please why not uh, sir it's always a pleasure to hear to you and uh, uh, i want to ask that any of uh, university in india uh, who, uh, they have successfully implemented nep 2020 uh, till date do we have some examples or role models like that uh, well uh, we are having documents about successful implementation we have received uh, uh, some documents from some universities i would not like to mention their name but uh, practically it's not possible to implement it so, so fast right like national curriculum framework is still working upon it right you have to uh, you know um, learning outcomes and curriculum framework so there are certain things which needs time and you know this is a very uh, very gigantic work this is a very huge task so you have to implement it with all considered opinion and thinking you have to put a lot of you know uh, you know mind boggling exercise and then you have to there are certain institutions which are saying that they have implemented but uh, quoting and citing them uh, without having personal experience would not be uh, 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 wise uh, kind of you know uh, uh, response i abstain myself from Uh, giving any kind of uh, such kind of uh, references right. yes sir thank you sir thank you uh sir uh, namaskar sir i have a question can i ask you sir yeah please uh, i am extremely thankful that we got very good information from you your knowledge sharing and uh, one thing is that uh, can we do one thing i have a simple suggestion uh, can we select something out of the nep and in uh, different universities some people will take it as one point and work on that and will collaborate all universities on this respect suppose a particular theme we are considering and a particular person is taking that charge and will link to the different universities of india and there will be a collaboration for a particular point 
focused point. Suppose uh, you are, uh, you are. That's a very wonderful idea. Why, That's why? Good idea, are... Ji. I think. I mean, uh... You have told uh, we have eliminated so much languages. We are daily we are talking English. We are ign ignoring our even if uh, Hindi also because all the deliberations are in English. So <laughs> we are marginalizing. Even if Hindi also. Hindi. Even if uh, I am belonging to Bhuvneshwar, if somebody is taking English, it's good. If somebody is talking <laughs> notes, doesn't know anything. That thing is going up everywhere. What is that? Yeah, it's a sweet language. I understand a bit of it, but I can't speak it. <laughs> so my limitation. Yes. Uh, that's a good question, Vishwasi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? So, uh, what's your call, uh, Professor uh, Ji? Ruchi, Ruchi, can you go for a formal concluding concluding uh, concluding session, Ruchi? Well, I was expecting a lot of questions on Academic Bank of Credit because that is the unit which has been successfully implemented by the government uh, but uh, 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 nobody uh, put a question on academic of credit that was something wonderful. in the morning session i got a big number of questions on academic bank of credit. so anyways some other day we will be discussing upon that okay uh, i think no question no suggestion ami sir you can conclude Rachi. okay uh, thank you, Chakrabal, sir. Thank you very much for wonderful and nice presentation and uh, very important presentation. And thank you all participants. Uh, uh, Nilesh, sir, you are here. Dr. Nilesh. Dr. Nilesh, you are here. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm going to give a formal vote of thanks. Uh, first and foremost, I thank our director, Professor Asi Sarma, sir for his support in organizing this event. Thank you, sir, for your guidance. You always encouraged us. Thank you very much. I also express my heartful thanks to Professor Chakravan, sir, Alu Kumar Chakravan, Vice Chancellor of Ghazidas uh, University. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be the speaker of today's program. Thank you very much. I also thank Professor Amir Kumar Rath, Dr. V. S. Pandey Ras, Dr. Nilesh Pandey for cooperating, coordinating this program. Uh, uh, now, uh, last but not the least, uh, I also thank our ICT team and our respected all distinguished participants for sparing your valuable time for making this program a successful. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you for uh, joining this program. Sabhi ko pranam aur namaskar. Very taraf se bhi, Professor Rami Raji, Professor Ashi, Doctor. Ponmodi Raji and CG, all of you and the entire team of NAC, I express my sincere gratitude. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, so much, sir. Thank you. Can I stop the program, Ami, sir? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Namaskar.